Jack, uh, I want to I want to thank you for appearing on the Indonesia Bitcoin Conference. Uh, it's it's unfortunate that you couldn't be here physically in Bali, uh, which is the island of the gods. Uh, I, presumably, you've been to Bali. I want to I want to ask you a few questions uh, this morning or this evening in the U.S. Uh, I want to start off with your background. You were born in St. Louis, Missouri, and you started out, you know, helping your mom with making cappuccino at her cafe. Uh, curiosity has been the big driver in your life. Uh, talk a little bit about how that has driven you into becoming what you are today. Um, well, I unfortunately have not been to, to Bali, and um, I'm looking forward to to going at some point in the future. I'm really sorry I couldn't make it in person. I just um, had a missed scheduling and um, could not get from New York to Bali in time uh, for the end of the conference. Um, but in, in terms of, um, yeah, I'm, I'm from St. Louis. I, my, my first job was my mother's coffee house. She, um, she, uh, chose to, St. Louis is a very, uh, segregated, divided city. She chose to put her coffee house right in the center of the city. It was a, definitely a place where the, the, you know, people from all over the city came by and, uh, I learned a lot about my, my mom, my, um, my city and entrepreneurship from, from that. I had no desire to ever be an entrepreneur, but I learned everything I needed to, um, from, from those moments and, and got my second job, which happened to be, um, a contracting job with my co-founder at Square. I had no idea I found a company with and no desire to found a company. But um, after after Twitter, I came back to St. Louis and found him again uh, after over a decade. And we created Square and, um, you know, the, uh, the, around, the, around the same time, the Bitcoin white paper came out and there was just something in the water that uh, in, inspired me even more into into another phase uh, i want to follow up with the the following question you you have made or created twitter which has allowed for communication to be a lot easier for the global community you've made square which is not block uh you know for purposes of making commerce a lot easier for the global community uh you've you've quoted uh william gibson who said that the future has arrived, but it hasn't been evenly distributed yet. Uh, I want to take that to, you know, the context of where we're living here, Indonesia, which is a developing country. I know you spend a lot of time in Africa and other developing economies. Do you see hope for a far better, far more even distribution of the future that has arrived? Yeah, hundred like percent. He he said that the the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. That was his quote, and I, I think it's a beautiful way to capture what we're all trying to build. Um, everyone in this room has certainly felt the future. We we felt it with a transaction that we received the first time we created a um, public private key pair for Bitcoin. The first time we read the white paper. I certainly felt that magic the first time. Maybe some of you have gone on Oster and experienced apps and, you know, the, the, the biggest at scale experiment of micropayments for content on the internet that I'm aware of. And, um, you, you can, you can feel it immediately and you know, it's just a matter of how we distribute it, how we spread it, how we, um, how we get it to more people and, um, I imagine, you know, that's the work of a lot of people in this room. You're, you're, we have many developers, we have engineers, we have designers, we have uh, advocates, we have educators. Um, every person plays a role. And, uh, you know, the, the, the magic all kind of comes back to this like very selfless act from, from Satoshi, Satoshi who, um, you know, creates something and then gave it to the world to develop further. And uh, there's a, you know, a, a, a beautiful and, and again, selfless gift. Um, and, you know, it's our job to 
to spread it. But with every every technology I found, it, like I, when I first experienced the internet when I was 12 or 13 years old in, in St. Louis, um, you, you had that feeling like this, this is the future. Why is it not everywhere right now? But you know, it's just going to happen. And, and that's, you know, what, what I felt with Bitcoin and what I feel right now with, uh, with Noster and, um, and, uh, yeah, and, and I, I hope you've all felt it too, because if you feel it, it, it's much easier to spread and it's much easier to spread that future. It has to be tangible. Before we get into uh, Bitcoin, I want to talk a little bit about technology. Uh, a lot of people have been saying that there's been a pretty significant degree of suppression of innovation in the past few decades. I know it's kind of weird because we've, we've heard a lot about, you know, innovations being made here and there in many parts of the world. But, you know, there's this argument that the central bank hasn't really been too innovative. You know, the only thing that they've been innovative in would have been by way of doing a massive scale of quantitative easing. And it hasn't really reached you know, most parts of the world. And it's gotten a little more elitized since a few decades ago, uh, you know, from a global economy standpoint. Do you, would you agree to the statement that, you know, there's been a pretty significant degree of suppression of innovation in the last few decades? And if you did, what do you think would be the antidote? And would Bitcoin fit into that? Uh, well, we're, I mean, in the last few decades, we had Bitcoin, so certainly there wasn't a suppression of innovation. We had something major that I, I think, um, well, it certainly replaces the need for the bank that you just talked about. Uh, and I, I can't think of a greater innovation than that to, um, replace an entire institution, replace an entire system, re you know, give, um, give, give something that, that uh you know people can use directly see directly um trust because they can they can verify it directly um that's pretty powerful and pretty innovative so i don't think there's been as if there has been any suppression of innovation it worked because it created more innovation and uh um you know the the, the right way will always find a way and um no matter how many People or, or systems um, are created to su suppress something. There, there's always there's always a way out, and I've certainly experienced that in my own lifetime and my own creations and my own work. Um, and you know, I think we're at a yet another precipice with with Bitcoin with with Noster. I think there's a I think Bitcoin showed a, a path, an alternative path um, that reminded us of the early internet that that was against the um the path of a more centralized corporate internet that that you know my my company was was going down as well and i think um that reminder was important and it only um it only helps um bloom and you know a, a thousand more flowers of, of people thinking about similar things and 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 building uh towards that mindset and i do think that is innovative i think that you know we the, the world kind of sees um things that move fast as the most innovative and they they may in the quote-unquote crypto space they may see things like ethereum as innovative because it has so many developers and it moves so quickly but quickly towards what is the question I think we need to ask. Bitcoin has been very deliberate and that means it's a little bit slower, but I think if the use case is currency, if it's replacing the central bank you speak of, if it's replacing the medium of exchange that, um, that we believe is, is possible and, and required for the internet going forward, don't we want it to be deliberate? Don't we want it to be a little bit slower. Don't we? Don't we want it to have the properties that Bitcoin has exhibited from day one? 
Um, so while that may not be seen as innovative because it doesn't iterate as fast, it will last longer and it will probably outlive all of us in this room. And I can't think of a deeper innovation than that, something that lasts, something that spans generations. So I, I, I don't know if there was this impression, it certainly, certainly produced the right thing. Well, I'm, I, I wasn't referring to, I wasn't referring to Bitcoin as something that would have been suppressing uh, innovation, but I was referring to most other things. Uh, you've, you've alluded to the beauty of Satoshi Nakamoto being a pseudo name and in the context of the creation of Bitcoin, why, why do you think that was a good thing that it was created with a pseudo name? Um, I, I don't know why Satoshi created it with a pseudonym, but, um, the reason why I, I, I believe it was the right thing to do is because it removed the ego from the equation. It enabled people to um, come in and participate and add, you know, their, their own voice and ego to it. And, uh, it, it didn't, um, it, it, it wasn't about like we had so many years and I was part of this, right? I, we had so many years of, um, this line, you know, lionizing founders and cults of personality. Um, and, um, you know, just like this founder ethos and, um, how we put, you know, these, these people on, on an altar. And, you know, I was, I was in a, you know, very similar position. And Satoshi chose a different path, um, which was pretty spiritual in a sense, in that uh, whoever this was didn't want to be, didn't, didn't, didn't feel it necessary for, for the work to be attached to their personality and their ego, and it could speak for itself. Um, and, you know, a pseudonym was a, the way to do that. And the work spoke for itself. I mean, if Satoshi came back today, I, you know, I hope people would thank whoever this is and be grateful, but I, I don't think they would change the course of, of Bitcoin much, um, given, given how much it's, um, you know, it, it was, it was built with that intent of living past, uh, a particular identity and, and past a particular person and it's worked. Um, you know, we, we've, we can all participate to carry the, carry the torch of it. And, uh, that's, again, that's pretty magical. When is the last time you experienced anything like that? <laughs> I, I don't know of one occurrence. I can't point to one other occurrence where someone created so, so, of something of such importance and, um, consequence without attaching their own name and personality and ego name one zero i i know you've been asked before but i'm gonna ask again could you be satoshi no. by any chance no 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 but i'm very i'm very i'm very grateful and if i if i knew who this person was or would ever had the honor of meeting this person i would i would just say thank you because it it reminded me of um, why I fell in love with the internet in the first place, why I fell in love with programming, why I fell in love with um, building and creating and, you know, cryptography and alt cypherpunks, like ev all the Bitcoin and uh, Satoshi in 2009 was a combination of like my childhood and my curiosity and everything that I aspired to be and everything I loved. And, um, I, uh, you know, I, my, my life went a different track, but it was a good, it was a good reminder of what was important. And I hope to get back to that even through a corporate lens, which, you know, I'm, I'm a part of right now with, uh, with block and square and, and formerly Twitter. You know, we, we seem to be living in a world where, 
values have diverged. And at the same time, wealth has diverged. And we're seeing this great tendency of people is wanting to immortalize themselves as opposed to the institutions. It, it just kind of feels that we need a lot more people or anybody like Satoshi who's never interested in immortalizing himself. I mean, he was really great at immortalizing institutional building, which I think the global community has learned to enjoy a great deal. Would, would that be the right path of thinking? Um, to follow, follow in this person's path? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, 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 you know, he's, he's never given seen, speeches, think, right? Ever yeah, since I, think he, we've seen, I think we've seen a bit of it. I mean, I know one recent example is Noster, like Fia Jaff, pseudonym, I have no idea who this person is. I think he's a person from Brazil. I've heard his accent sounds Brazilian. He's got the Brazilian sarcasm and um, he's, you know, a little bit uh, abrasive. So he fits the pattern, but I have no clue who this person is. He, he created something brilliantly simple and people recognize that and wanted to support, including myself. And you have developers now all over the world who are taking not only what he built, but mixing it with what Satoshi built in the form of uh, what William did with uh, of, of Damas with Zaps, who I, I think is at that conference. I hope he's at that conference. Sorry to miss you, William and Vanessa, um, the mystery. But, you know, you have, peop you have people like Will who, you know, took these, these two pseudonyms and believed in what they created and are creating something new. And I, I think it's a use case that the world um, hasn't really realized the, the true value of. But again, it's like the only, it's the biggest singular um, experiment of micropayments on the internet. We've been talking about micropayments on the internet since people were talking about the internet since I was a kid um, in you know, on my parents' computer in St. Louis, people were talking about micropayments and what if. And then we had folks like Theodore Nelson who created Xanadu, which was uh, a system prior to the to the web and Tim Berners-Lee work, um, Hypertext, and um, all these systems were, were were talking about what is now what now exists within Zaps and within Noster and. Fiat Jaff, whoever this person is, um, chose to follow in Satoshi's footsteps. Hopefully he'll s stay around a little bit longer than Satoshi, but I understand why Satoshi left. And I would understand, you know, a similar path for Fiat Jaff. And I hope there's more people like this. So Spiral, one of the, um, uh, we, we created this very small team of developers within Block who are just there to make Bitcoin better, have made grants to pseudonyms from people around the world. We have no idea where they live, who they are, um, but we know what they do. And they've proved their, their work and their worth. And we trust that. And I hope that continues to be a model in the future where we see more pseudonyms and more people that want to want the work to speak for itself, independent of their ego, um, uh, that, you know, that they choose that path and we can support them. How, how do you think, then. how do you think the creation of something like Bitcoin through a pseudo name would be able to resist this massive resistance from the pre-existing establishment called fiat and and you know in, in in the famous words of somebody that you know i mean money is really a database that allows for the exchange of goods and services right and money has to have certain qualities 
It's got to be durable. It's got to be recognizable. It's got to be divisible. It's got to be portable. It's got to be scarce. Bitcoin just seems like the perfect antidote or answer to any pre-existing monetary instrument. It, it allows for that optimal intersection between what travels over time and what travels over space. But the fiat establishment just seems so doggedly sticky without any ability to show open-mindedness about this cool innovation. How, how do you think we're going to be able to overcome that resistance? Ignore it. Could you be more I, I, elaborate? I okay, well, there's a big hand here. <laughs> no, I mean, but we're 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 building. I mean, like, um, what what Zaps is showing is like, I think it's the first, the first way to like you you can. I, and I've I've had this experience. I've had, I have a friend from Israel, and I have a friend from uh, Bordeaux, France, and, um. Both of them had no idea what Bitcoin was, and they had no idea what Nostra was, but they were curious. And I signed both of them up. They're named Dor and Lulu. They're on um, Nostra. You can search for them. They started making some posts and creating some notes, and um, I reposted them and renoted them, and they. Um, you know, we're exposed to the, the circle of people that follow me. They hooked up, they, they both downloaded Wallet of Satoshi, which is an incredible onboarding tool. I don't know how this company does it, but they built something truly simple and um, instant. And it was a first step and they hooked that up to Damas and they got non-KYC Bitcoin within an hour. And then they use that Bitcoin to zap other people, the posts that they liked, and suddenly you have the circular economy and where did fiat enter the equation? It's far in the past. So as they continue creating things and people, one of them is a DJ and Another, it's a surfer, real estate dude who um, lives in, well, hangs out in Bordeaux and lives in Bordeaux. But they create really great content and, you know, they get paid for it through Zaps and Bitcoin. And um, they only know it to be this thing that on the side allows them to, to create and potentially make a little bit of money. But they they use it to, um, you know, give give that to other people on the on the network but there's no reason why they couldn't use wallet satoshi if they happen to be in bali um this uh this week with you all or in nostrasia next week in tokyo at a merchant that accepts bitcoin they've both earned over a hundred dollars it's a meaningful amount and they can buy a drink a coffee a beer a piece of clothing and all that done with out accepting any fiat whatsoever so do we have to pay attention to it i don't think so like we need to create new use cases where we can ignore it more and more and i, I think those are all in sight right now and they're so tangible that you can you can actually use them and feel them today but again it goes back to how you open this like the future is already here it's just not evenly distributed we have a significant um accessibility problem we have a significant design problem. We don't have enough designers who think cohesively end to end around an experience and how the experience feels from hearing about it to going to a website or downloading an app to receiving a payment, however that is, to using it in the, fr in, you know, we, we need people who are thinking cohesively end to end about that experience and how to make it feel great end to end without any you know, jumping icons or bugs or um, it just feels super, super solid with that whole flow and that whole journey feeling um, as tangible and as real as going to a bank, getting 50 bucks and going to, you know, 
um, a store or a farmer's market and putting that down and getting a real app. Like it needs to feel that tangible and that cohesive and that like rock solid. And unfortunately today it doesn't because, um, you know, we have a lot of hackers like, like I was that are putting things up and putting things together and they work, but they don't really feel great together. And that, and that's what is, is missing in Bitcoin. There's a lot of dev developers and designers focus on this problem now, but, um, this going to take a little bit of time before we, before we really get there. And, and then it, it, you know, then we get more of the doors and the, the Lulus without, you know, someone like me, um, who, who lo who's loved this since 2009, um, to encourage them and kind of sit with them to get on it. Um, but it, to me, it's just a matter of design and accessibility and we're like right on the precipice. Um, but we're, we're not, we're not unfortunately there yet. I want to get back to accessibility in a bit, but I want to push a little bit on fiat. What What is your prediction in terms of what's going to happen to fiat in the near foreseeable future? Well, I made a prediction <laughs> some time ago around hyperinflation. I'm going to stick with that one. But I will say that anyone who makes predictions like this has no idea what they're talking about because no one knows what's going to happen. And all we can do is prepare for the future we want to live in. And um, the future I want to live in doesn't really consider fiat, so I don't know if it really matters. It it, it seems to have, you know, we're living in this era of unnecessarily high time preference, right? And and I have kids, and I'm vested in wanting to make the world a little bit better for my kids, so that we can live with. <laughs> a much better way of deferring gratification. But in a world where the printing of money is just so pervasive, it inflates economies around the world unnecessarily. And I think it screws up morality and it screws up capital allocation. When, when do you think all these are going to end up? And... And when do you think we're going to see a true inflection point where there's really scale, you know, for Bitcoin, for people in Africa, people in Indonesia? I mean, you know, I live in Indonesia. It's, it's, it's the third largest democracy in the world, but it's still a developing economy with a GDP of per capita of $4,500, not exactly a high income country. So we've got a long way to go and we're structurally impeded by insufficient money supply what do you um, think when, when, when do i think it it turns um i i don't i like like the last question i don't know i don't think anyone knows and anyone taking a guess is probably going to be wrong and um we can make a bunch of predictions following the tea leaves but i, I think it's just better to build for the reality rather than wait for it and like we have a bunch of people in the room and a bunch of people on Nostr who are, who are building that. And again, like, I think we, we, I, I think, um, I, I do think the global South Africa, Indonesia, central South America will lead in terms of the use case because the use case in, uh, Western countries in the U S where I'm from in Europe, um, maybe in India, um, is, is very much focused on the store of value use case, which is a viable use case. And, you know, one that focuses a lot of our attention on, on the number and the number go up and, you know, certainly there's, there's value to that because the more it's valued, you know, the more attention it has and the more people that care about it, the more people developing for it. The, the more designers wanting to fix the accessibility issues I, I was speaking to, but the use, there are other use cases out there that are, um, utilized every single day and really important to people and remittance, I think is the biggest one for the global South. And I think it's extremely powerful. And you go to Nigeria, Ghana, Rwanda, Kenya, um, uh, Costa Rica, 
there's a there's an area in Costa Rica called the Vita Dominical, which has a circular Bitcoin economy called Bitcoin Jungle. Um, that's that's more of 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 payments. I realize, but like there's a there's a big uh, remittance uh, use case throughout the country and across borders: Nicaragua, Costa Rica, uh, Mexico, U.S., um, Venezuela, Argentina. And and certainly Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, uh, Rwanda, and and more. So like, look at look at Nigeria. Um, during the end SARS protest, the government went around and found all the protesters, shut asked the banks to shut down their bank accounts, um, shut down Western Union uh, during those protests, and people turned on Bitcoin addresses and. The world responded by sending Bitcoin to them, and um, they were able to send that that Bitcoin amongst themselves as well. So, I, th I again, it, it goes back to the quote: "Like the future is already here; it's just not evenly distributed." And then we have to look at these use cases and look at where they can be utilized more and and spread them and make them more accessible. And it's it's all a function of like building and and more people wanting to build for the system because it's. Uh, you know, because it's the right thing to do and it helps the majority of people instead of building for things that, you know, only help um, a certain class of people, such as all of Web3 and um, a lot of, you know, Ethereum. I'm sure there's some really good projects within Ethereum as well, but um, not for the currency use case, not, not for the remittance use case, not for the store of value use case. You could argue with that, of course, but like, um, like I, I, I want my I want my currency to be what Bitcoin is and and has its attributes and that it lasts. Um, so like I, I think more and more people will come around to that notion as they see the importance of it. And there's more conflict in the world emerging every single day that uh, points towards the reasons why it's it requires more attention and it requires more development. I'm I'm in a camp that believes that sub-Saharan countries, most developing countries in the world have great ideas. And what stops them from becoming a Jack Dorsey or all the great personalities in Silicon Valley is really access to capital or lack thereof. Right. And to the extent that Bitcoin can serve as a true alternative to a pre existing convention, then I think there's this structural technological impediment where there needs to be an improvement in the context of how the number of transactions over Bitcoin or involving Bitcoin can increase on a per second basis, on a per minute basis, you know, to the level that fiat has been able to be achieving so far, if not better. How, how do you see that technological impediment being overcome? Oh, well, that's just work. Um, I, think, I think to your point of access to capital, uh, I, it's right, like, you know, there, there is a, you know, there, there's a sig significant concentration in places like Silicon Valley. Um, I had to move from St. Louis to New York to San Francisco. I tried to start a company in New York. Uh, was you know, we we tried to start Square in New York after after Twitter, and we couldn't afford to pay any engineers because the hedge funds were paying them eight hundred thousand dollars a year, and they didn't have you know the concept of equity and um and and what made you know san francisco companies thrive um in in that model and again there's arguments for and against those models but it is what it is we, we were able to move very very quickly because of it and and because there were so many people thinking in the same way you could have really interesting conversations meet great engineers make great meet meet great designers and build something super quick those Communities are building in other places. Ghana is one such place. 
Nigeria and, and Lagos is another such place I've, I've experienced it myself, especially within the Bitcoin realm. Um, and there, there are places in Costa Rica, um, in, in South America, in Central America that, you know, see similar attention, but the, the capital is not necessarily there yet. But I do think it will follow. And I, I do think it'll follow from, you know, dem demonstrating more of the, of the use cases, but I do think it also needs a jump start. It, this is one of the reasons why, um, uh, myself and uh, Jay Z created a, a fund um, called B Trust, where we gave uh, 500 Bitcoin, um, which was a lot of money when we gave it at the time, and it'll be a lot of money in the near future again. Um, we gave uh, this 500 Bitcoin to uh, a board. Um, this is a, a board of uh, you know four people, and they're hiring a CEO. They all are on the continent of Africa. Um, one of them is a core, um, uh, a Bitcoin core developer. Um, sorry, two of them actually. Uh, and um, one of them created Fetty, uh, Fetty Mint, which I hope that some of you are aware of. If not, you should you should explore it. But you know, really, really great people who are now tasked with um, granting that that 500 Bitcoin into the global South to, um, really support these use cases that are actually critical needs instead of like Bitcoin in the, in the U S and in a lot of Western countries is you could argue. And I would argue that is a lot out of desire. Um, but the Bitcoin use case in the global South is out of need and necessity and necessity, you know, creates amazing invention. And it, it does lack capital and support right now, but you know, this is one way to, to jumpstart that. And then, you know, as you make these grants to people, they will, um, you know, earn more and, um, be able to grant themselves and, and help a, a broader ecosystem. And the most beautiful thing about the, the Bitcoin and, and I think also the, the Noster ecosystem. Um, which I keep mentioning because I think they're so symbiotic and they help each other immensely um, or will help each other immensely is that if you create a company or you create a project for Bitcoin, everyone in the Bitcoin ecosystem benefits and anything they do to benefit it, you get benefit from. Like it's just the most amazing virtuous cycle I've experienced. And um, of course there are bad actors. And there are people looking to scam, and we've certainly had them in the Bitcoin space, and of course the broader crypto space. But uh, you know the 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 ecosystem is um, resilient, and it's going to look out for itself, and it will self correct, and it will have the antibodies to you know destroy the um, the, the things that try to harm it. it. Has a good immune system, I should say, and. Um, and, and we've seen that many times and we'll see it again and again and again. But the fact that like I can create, I can focus my company right now on doing everything I can imagine to help Bitcoin and everyone who also works on Bitcoin or starts a Bitcoin company benefits from that and anything they do, we benefit as well. Like it's just amazing. Just to, to give you a sense, uh... Indonesia, which is not a small potato, it's, um, you know, the largest population in Southeast Asia, the fourth most populous country in the world, the third largest democracy in the world. We sit on money supply to GDP ratio of around 45%. The banking asset to GDP ratio, 45%. Capital markets to GDP ratio, 45%. And it's typical of the other Southeast Asian countries with the absolute exception of Singapore. And it's slightly better than most African countries, right? Uh, within the context of those ratios. I, j I just kind of think that, you know, I'm a big believer of Bitcoin. It's just mm -hmm. gonna take time 
for those ratios to improve so that we have true access to capital for people with great ideas in the villages, in the remote areas of countries like Indonesia. So I think it's going to require patience in addition to technological innovation, right? Uh, I want to take you to the next topic of energy. There's always been this conversations about how we're going to be able to energize Bitcoin, right? And there's this narrative of sustainability that wants carbon neutrality by 2050, which is only 27 years away. But what's so paradoxical is that that narrative only resonates to about 15 to 20 percent of the population of the world, whereas the rest are just more worried about putting food on the table. They don't care whether it's coal or whatever. It's got to be affordable. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm throwing a bunch of things there, but how do you think Bitcoin is going to fit into that picture where we're going to have to try to reconcile the narrative of sustainability with the narrative of development so that we can find the right technological solution from an energy creation standpoint in the most optimal way for developing countries. But the economics also needs to work. Well, first, I would, I would start with like um, the only way we progress is by producing more energy. Correct. So like. We, we need to create as much energy as possible. And there are a multitude of ways to do so. And I'm a huge fan of, of nuclear energy. Same here. Um, I, I think it was, you know, overlooked in, you know, more of the 60s days. And it's a nearly perfect form of energy. And it's becoming safer and safer. You know, if, um, if you, if you, if you feared, a lot of its faults in the past, um, a lot of those have been mitigated. It isn't, you know, as cost effective as other, other forms of energy to initially create, but once it's running, um, it's far more, far more cost efficient and efficient in general. But I, I think the, I think, you know, starting with the realization and, and the, and the principle of only by producing as much energy as possible will we progress to solve the majority of um, the needs for, for the world and really advance humanity. And there's going to be transitions where we go from something that might be, you know, truly polluting. You can actually see the, the clouds of pollution and the people that have to live by that to one that is not. And that we have a progression as quickly as possible. Um, Bitcoin. Bitcoin's role in that is to always drive towards efficiency. Um, just the, the mining model will drive towards the most cost effective solution. I spend a lot of time in Costa Rica. We have the benefit of having, you know, the majority of the country powered by hydroelectric, um, which is very cheap, free, you know, quote unquote energy. And there are, you know, um, places like that within Kenya, all over Africa, um, uh, all over Central America, South America, <coughs> even in um, North America, that you can replicate this um, all over Texas, recapturing uh, unwanted energy or unused energy. So, you know, like water, Bitcoin finds a way to recapture the energy and to um, make it valuable. Um, you know, even, you know, if you were to package a, which people do package a, a Bitcoin miner into, a, you know, in the form factor of a space heater or a water heater or a, a hot tub water heater, uh, all, all these things have been, have been done. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just looking at more creative ways to use the energy and to use something like Bitcoin to incentivize more creativity. So, um, our, my, my company block is, is, you know, building a open source, um, Bitcoin mining system. And one of our hopes is that it will be used by industry and also consumers to find new ways to utilize energy 
and you let utilize energy in a um, efficient means where it's you know potentially creating multiple use cases such as um a space heater that pays for itself um because of the energy it's using and the heat it naturally offputs um but there's going to be many many more examples but i think we all have to align and admit that we're only going to advance by creating more opportunities for energy and that you know the the best way to make sure that everyone maintains health is to find you know cleaner more renewable um, sources of energy but there will be a transition phase and, and we can't just forego the current uh, models today because it would cut off energy for people that need it right now and it would therefore cut off the advancement generally the, the the transition i think could be very long right just just to give you you know a sense uh, Indonesia and India, which are classic developing economies, right? We're, we're electrified to the extent of about 1300 kilowatt hour per capita. And, and I think it takes modernity to reach the level of understanding with respect to sustainability. And, and modernity can be defined in many ways, but one way of defining modernity is really a country's being electrified to the extent of about five to 6,000 kilowatt hour per capita. If we were to use that rule of thumb, at the rate India generates about 19,000 megawatts of power per year, Indonesia 3,000 megawatts of power generation capabilities per year, it's gonna take India and Indonesia about 100 years to reach 6,000 kilowatt hour per capita. And that's completely <laughs> irreconcilable with the 27 year period until 2050 right so we're just going to have to wait longer so there needs to be a way to accelerate the development of energy that's environmentally clean that's scalable but that's economically viable and and for india and indonesia to reach viability it needs to be at at most five cents per kilowatt and you can't charge nuclear hydro solar at any point less than 20 cents per kilowatt so it's just mind-boggling for people like me in the developing economies so it's going to take a while i think uh you know for that reconciliation between the narrative of sustainability and the narrative of development in the meantime we can try to do our best to improve the use case scenario for bitcoin mining and bitcoin you know at the downstream level uh but the big variable on the energy creation i think uh, it's going to take a long time to resolve yeah no doubt but it will be resolved and, and there will be shortcuts and advancements that like can can move that faster jack uh we've got seven more minutes uh, i want to i want to touch on your personal lifestyle you walk to work every day and you walk home every day about an hour to an hour and a half you take the same route almost every day sometimes you deviate a little bit to the extent that you're listening to a different podcast that's going to take longer why do you do that well, well that, that was when i was full-time in san francisco um but you know that the consistent thing is um i i want to you know i try to find a a routine that allows me to to think and walking is the, the best uh, version of that. If I was there with you all, I'd be walking on the beach every morning, um, whatever the longest stretch of beach I could find. And I can go like, I, I usually do about two hours a day, but if, you know, the beach allows it or the road allows it, I'll do four or five, whatever it takes, um, early in the morning or, or surf early in the morning, um, at, at sunrise to, um, just, you know, clear my head and, uh, think and um i'm i'm a big fan of you know looking for serendipity and like what comes my way and believe that the most important things always come back to the surface again and again and again and you can't ignore them and walking is a good way to get those um and surfing is a good way to get that serendipity in those in those moments so um yeah i, I just take advantage of the the nature around me i like i like being outside and uh then um just 
being being um walking walking or surfing <laughs> presumably you've been to bali right and you've been surfing here no i haven't been to bali i i i, I said i like i can't wait to go and i want to there's so many waves um i want to experience and uh i really 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 been looking forward to it i'm super <laughs> super sad that i didn't i didn't get to join y'all but i i will be i will get out there are you still eating once a day? Uh, yeah. yeah. So if, um, if I eat once a day, could I become Jack Dorsey? I, I don't know if you want to. I don't know if you want to be, but um, I, I like experimenting a lot. Like I, I like I, I experimented with my diet a lot, and uh, I was vegan for two years, and it was the worst thing for me that I ever did. Um, I'm sure it works for for some people. It just did not work for me. And um, I experienced with fasting, intermittent fasting, and fasted seven days, and experimented with meditation. All these things I just like testing on myself and ex experimenting and see what sticks and see what practice like I continue with. And uh, and you know I, I I need I need to experience it myself. Um, and uh, eating once a day like the first thing i experienced in the first month is like wow i have a superpower because like all these people have to like eat three times a day i only have to eat once a day and like it feels like i get all this time back and it just felt like really i know it feels it sounds kind of stupid but it felt amazing and uh and then i would like skip a day and that felt even more amazing and i learned a bunch uh you know about autophagy and <coughs> longevity and um all all these things so you know it, it's just like practicing these extremes to figure out like what it teaches you ultimately like everything is a teacher and it's just you know how do you how do you learn from it are, are you open to learning from it and then how do you learn from it so what about meditation what has it done to you <clears throat> uh everything i mean like i i took a my friend introduced me to vipassana and again like this well all, all you in bali probably doesn't sound that woo woo because you're in bali but when you explain this to you know normal people it sounds a little bit like you know hippie and uh out there especially for someone um in corporate america such as i was i think there was like a episode of black mirror made about me meditating um and it's funny haha -ha, but like it's <laughs> it's actually a meaningful practice so a, a guy introduced me and i've been like trying to meditate for like you know over a decade and i was doing like five minutes or 30 minutes and like wasn't really serious about it and then i asked him he'd been meditating for a while i asked him like what should i do he's like well if you really want to go extreme do this practice called vipassana it's 10 days they take your phone you can't read you can't write you can't exercise you can't look anyone in the eye you can't speak with anyone there's no music um there's no stimulation at all you wake up at four you start meditating at 4 30. you have breakfast lunch no dinner and you stop at nine and you go to bed at 9 30. and you do that for 10 days and you sit on the floor cross-legged ideally just on the floor with like a tiny little mat for two hours at a time every single thing about your body hurts and all you're doing is just scanning your body for sensations of pain or pleasure and you are training yourself to observe those and then not react to it you could get up and the pain would go away you'd have no pain in your knees no pain in your back you disappear and the whole teaching is this feeling of pain is impermanent you're reacting to something that's impermanent in this moment you could get up right now it go away so why do we suffer so much for something that's impermanent and that's the metaphor for life life is impermanent why suffer because it goes away why not um take joy in it and uh it's a very 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 difficult practice and you know on day seven 
you're looking around and everyone looks like a Buddha to you in the room and you're like struggling and then you like get it then you feel it and then the next morning it all falls apart and you're crying again but it's just again it's a teacher everything is a teacher so put yourself in some uncomfortable situations like meditation or not eating um not for too long drink water um or doing something you've never done before like you know those of you in the room haven't surfed yet first time in bali go surf um there's a very nice very nice longboard wave right outside <laughs> where the conference center is i believe um and uh and then just go go do it see what it feels like see i'm you with you man i i've done that too so the last question you've you've alluded to revolution being better than disruption talk about that well the the context for that is like um you know my my cohort of uh technology companies google facebook mainly facebook was all around like moving fast and breaking things and disruption and you have to be a disruptor and you look at that word and like you realize what it is and like it, disruption is like destructive chaos <laughs> and and the thing that always got me about using that word is like it had no purpose whatsoever it was just like random chaos to be disruptive and i know i'm being overly literal here but you look at that versus like revolution which has deep purpose and a reason why and a feeling of movement and that's what the internet was after it was developed by the military thank you very much and the people took it and made it their own it had this movement quality to it this revolution quality where it had purpose the purpose was to free information to free cryptography to free mathematics to free knowledge to make it universally accessible to everyone um, no matter who they were or where they lived or where they came from how they grew up and that was a uh, that wasn't disruption that was revolution and bitcoin to me is not disruption it's that paper is a revolution that paper is a manifesto um and it has purpose and that purpose was you know inscribed in 2009 with the first block the genesis block and the headline of um you know the chancellor and uh bailing out the banks the second time so you know i i, I was just very much against this term that my my industry and my my world was using which was like disruption and there was a tech crunch disrupt it was a conference and the whole thing was just like insane Versus like, shouldn't we be striving for like movements and revolutions and like, can that actually come from a corporate thing? And I don't think it can ultimately, which is why you find this work in open protocols such as Bitcoin, such as Nostra, um, Tor, um, and like, uh, and, and you have these incredible advocates who are so fortunate to have such as Edward Snowden who, if you haven't seen his speech at Bitcoin Amsterdam, please take 30 minutes out of your life. He's an incredible follow on, on Nostra, a huge believer. We're going to be interviewing him at the, at the conference, um, Nostasia, Nostasia in, uh, you know, November 1st through the 3rd. It'll be broadcast. So you got great people here and, uh, they want to build and they want to, be part of a movement and want to create a revolution and you know that that that's what we need right now not not just random random chaos we need purpose jack you've 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 done great things you've done things on the basis of intuition timelessness and value for that we admire you and thank you for attending and gracing this event thank you <laughs> right, thank you yeah. I I only wish you were here, man, physically. We no, only please, wish you were here please. physically. We got a surfboard here ready for you. No, but but please, I, I know you're in the conference room and I know you're listening to all these these talks and I, I heard the last one and it's amazing. 
but I, the best part of these conferences is actually getting out to the community and uh and meeting the real people and like you know leaving leave them a mark in some way and the mark you all you all can leave is you know get someone signed up for for bitcoin and teach them why it's important and teach them uh you know why it can why it can help them and and why it keeps their government in check uh and uh and any authority in check so you know please you know just pull someone aside that lives there and is native and uh, whether it be a surfer that you see in the in the lineup or on the street and just you know show them what show them, show them why you're at this conference that that it, again it's like back to the original quote future's already here it's just not evenly distributed it's us up to us to distribute it william gibson thank you, thank you so much jack take care yeah good Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. That was Jack Dorsey. Inilah Endgame.